That's true, that's true. Okay, so um, I'm still Vijal Sangani from EuroIX. And um, we've got a little panel here uh, to talk about um, some IXP best practices. And what we're going to actually concentrate on in this particular session is looking at um, how, uh, looking at best practices when actually setting up the IXP. Uh, later on this afternoon, there's another panel which will be talking a bit more about uh, general IXP best practices. So, uh, I've put a couple of hashtags there, so those of you that are uh, tweeting, feel free to, to use those. I think uh, Des uh, mentioned those earlier. So, uh, first of all, this is our panelist, and I would like to ask each one of, the, um, each one of you to um, introduce yourselves and also give a little, just a little introduction and also a talk through of uh, you know, the really early starting days of your um, setting up uh, your IXP. So let's start with uh, Zoran. Yes, we'll go in order okay. here. Thank you. <laughs> so the first uh, internet exchange in Serbia actually was not SOX. It was something that my partner Nena did uh, 10 years ago. It was a shared LAN where a couple of ISPs connected. Then four years ago, it started as an idea. Okay, let's make it bigger, better, shinier, and everything. So first what we did, we configured out servers, then we bought switches, then uh, we tested it for quite some time, then we connected first customers. And uh, to be honest, first two years was all about getting customers on the network. Really, a lot of effort, a lot of uh, explaining what uh, IXP concept is and now that almost all the big operators are connected uh, I think we can talk about quality issues, about security issues, no longer about the need of IXP. Right. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Harold? Okay, my, my name is Harald Michel and I work for the Vienna Internet Exchange. And similar to what Matthias already told us, uh, Vienna Internet Exchange was founded in 1996, so it was a completely different time from about five years ago. Uh, the reason why the Vienna Internet Exchange was founded was that Vienna University has a very strong position in the historical development of the Internet in Austria. So the first neutral pop in Vienna was in fact at Vienna University, and we also hosted an uh, Ebon uh, pop at that time. So it was obvious that uh, all of the ISPs had to have uh, local loops to our POP and therefore the logical consequence was to start an exchange point there. Uh, started with a coax cable like uh, Matthias <laughs> showed us in the beginning and then of course evolved uh, from, uh, from this time on. Thank you. Uh, Matthias? Oh, yeah. I've, I've spoken about SIX earlier so I won't repeat that. Uh, maybe about myself, I, I work at Tarnes, I told you that before, I, I'm a networking engineer and I'm really fond of IPv6, uh, not forget that. So this is one of the initiatives we also have in Slovenia. And the other one, which is might, might be related to uh, internet exchanges all over the world, is to share common, best common practices. So can I announce maybe? Yeah. I will take an opportunity to announce that we'll be starting a, a knock in Slovenia in a few days, a kind of a network operators forum. So we really like the idea to share the knowledge and best practices all around on a national scale. Sorry for a little commercial. No, 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 it's, it's, it's good actually. I've, I've got some questions on yeah, community okay. and community building later, so uh, no, it's good. Okay, so I want to try and make this session a little bit... Do I not get to introduce myself, B.J.? Oh, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's okay, I'm invisible. Um, sorry. My name's Mike Hughes. Um, I used to be uh, CTO of uh, Lynx in London, uh, and I was there for about 12, 13 years. Uh, before then, I actually worked at an ISP that was connected to Lynx. Um, wasn't one of the founding members of Lynx, but certainly there very early on, uh, and that was a UK ISP. Um, so, I worked for Lynx since 1999 um, and, and then left there a few years ago. 
Um, I'm now a freelance consultant um, and then get involved in whatever needs doing really. Um, and the other, one of the other things I do is um, I'm also uh, involved with uh, UK NOF, which is the NOG in the yeah, UK. Yeah. So I'm one of the uh, one of the directors of UK NOF in the UK. So I help I, I help Keith uh, Keith when it was set up. So uh, that that. So, so we should talk, yeah. Uh, but we're here to talk about AXPs and not NOGs at the moment. So I'll try and talk, fill in about um, trouble, you know, br trouble in terms of growing pains and things like that that Lynx had uh, in its evolution. And, and uh, we didn't start at Lynx with um, a thin Ethernet. We actually had like a, th a little 3Com uh, 10 meg hub. If you remember the little 3Com yeah. 8 port 10 meg hubs, <laughs> that's what we started with. Um, so yeah, there was five, there was five members initially, and the the interesting thing I'll just take, which is different from, um, say Vienna and other places, was there wasn't necessarily a natural place for links to be initially. Um, there wasn't this natural con place where people were, were all present. The closest one that could be found was a, a university computing centre, like yeah. Vienna, uh, where people were picking up some bandwidth. But most people had their own. Data, their own sort of small data centres, and because this was in the early 90s, people had their own small data centres and they were connect, collecting transit locally rather than actually building into a central place. So at one point there was a consideration of whether the exchange in London would be in the uh, university, yeah. you know, the ULCC data centre. And in the end what had happened was there was also of course the financial sector in London and there was a large disaster recovery facility that was built for providing non-stop service to banks but they of course had changed their strategy and this place was just way too big so that company which became which is Telehouse started parceling out its space and selling it to ISP so that then became the natural place for for links to go yeah. so that's just the difference between say how, how Vienna started up in terms of like, you know, location. We nearly went to the University Computing Centre. In hindsight, we did the right thing going into Telehouse because if we had been in the University Computing Centre, that would have constrained our growth. Yeah. Anyway, there you go. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I was just thinking ahead when when I forgot to introduce Mike, but uh, okay, now that's done. So um, I want to try and make this session a little bit interactive. So I've got I've got some questions prepared, and I'm going to be asking questions to the panelists. And um, if you have any questions or just something that pops up in your head and you want to uh, ask either myself or the panel, then please just um, put your hand up. And I think we have mics that are uh, we can uh, we can actually uh, take around now. So. Um, I'm going to leave this slide up so you can all see who, who's who and where they're, where they're from. Um, are there any questions already from the introduction that's... Uh, oh. Okay, so I have uh, my first question is, during the early days, um, what hidden challenges did you come across? Now, we all, when, we're, when we're planning something, we all expect there to be uh, you know, some, some small challenges, but what came across that you were not expecting that kind of you know, came and bit you and you were like, oh, uh, I wasn't expecting that or um, it was a bit of a surprise. Um, Matthias, should we start with you? Of course. Um, my hidden, su my surprise, biggest surprise was actually that Telecom, the bigger player, joined this small secondary facility. So they found out that they were the biggest at the time, but they found out that it is a good thing to join the community and not stay there for themselves. That was kind of a surprise for me. A nice surprise. And, and then wow. I was working for them at that time. Yeah. I, I can talk to you about that later. So we've had some <laughs> inside information from the gentleman in the first row. But that was actually and then, then we knew that it will go further. It will, it will happen. Yeah. And so, hope I answered your. Yeah. Main yeah. Main and then, and Is actually, um, you know, sometimes when you talk about hidden challenges or uh, you know surprises that come and come and bite you, you kind of think of like negative things. But this is actually positive, so that's nice. Yeah, it's positive. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Zoran. Okay, so 
maybe the biggest uh, surprise for us was that the local content is simply not there. When we connected uh, a lot of uh, domestic ISPs, operators, we just learned that Serbian content hosted in Serbian networks is really not that big. Mm -hmm. uh, for some time we even struggled to understand how we are going to make a return of our uh, investment on such a low traffic levels. Uh, then we started uh, cooperating with Google, with Akamai, with regional IXPs and traffic uh, grows uh, significantly. But in general that was, uh, that was the biggest uh, inherited obstacle. The second one, which we did not anticipate, and we anticipated many problems. <laughs> uh, the one that we did not anticipate is some kind of uh, disbelief in concept of IXP. So we had to, to, to work really a lot to, to explain that the concept of, uh, of Internet Exchange is actually viable. Right. Uh, of course, it helped that we started it in 2009, when uh, all over the world you can find uh, a lot mm -hmm. of uh, positive uh, examples of how IXPs uh, actually contribute to the quality and resilience of the service. But explaining that uh, to all of the market participants in Serbia was, uh, was surprisingly difficult for us. Okay, the biggest companies that already have uh, experience with working with Wix or with Lynx or Bix, uh, it was just like, okay, sucks. <laughs> yeah. but, but for others to learn uh, the benefits of using Exchange, it was a surprise. Okay, that's interesting. Um, going back to your first challenge, uh, you mentioned the content wasn't there. Was it, was the con was the Serbian content being hosted somewhere else or uh, or there just wasn't any, or how, how has that changed now? Uh, both and yes. Okay. <laughs> so uh, a lot of uh, interesting uh, sites were hosted uh, outside in Hetzner or wherever, some, some cheap hosting uh, platforms. Uh, then uh, last couple of years a big hosting companies uh, actually emerged and now one of biggest mainstream hopefully we will have tomorrow a uh, guy from from mainstream talking about local internet perspective uh, they are now generate something like four gig of traffic a couple of years ago uh, three of their biggest customers hosted their content uh, outside of Serbia so the emergence of mainstream actually helped the content come back yeah. and develop here more uh, yeah. more uh, efficiently uh, on the other hand, we have register of National Internet Domain of Serbia, RANIC, CCTLD of, uh, of Serbia, who is actually promoting development uh, of uh, local content. They have, they have some, some funds and they, they fund uh, or partially fund the projects uh, that uh, have the goal of developing the local content. So you will see a lot of different uh, angles to this, uh, to this issue of uh, of local content and maybe the biggest contributor came to be over the top television. So internet TV, when they emerged and they emerged in Serbia like six months ago, it was like <laughs> a lot of traffic, <laughs> really a lot of traffic. Yeah. Uh, we still cannot call that local content because right. it's just uh, internet streaming. Yeah. Uh, but okay, traffic is there. And, and I guess the message is going out that, you know, there is the exchange here, you can host your local content there, and, uh, and it would be interesting to see how that progresses in a couple of years. Of course. Uh, back a little bit to the history, we started with two carrier neutral locations, one being University of uh, School of Electrical Engineering, Werner is professor, and another was, is a, was a business building uh, in, uh, in downtown of Belgrade, where a lot of fiber uh, of alternative operators was. So we were in no position to host anybody's equipment. Mm -hmm. Then we moved uh, one step further. Now we have four more locations in biggest data centers in Belgrade. So we have a really, really nice uh, partner in Telenor. Uh, Telenor Telehouse is tier three certified. 
We have uh, in two telehouses of Orion and we have in another business building in Ushchi. So, so that helped a little bit because we came closer to, right. to, to content providers. And uh, for example, we connected mainstream both in Telenor and in Orion. Uh, for him, it was difficult to come to Beograđanka or Faculty right. of Electrical Engineering, but we came closer to data centers. Yeah. And then data center operator take care of fire extinguisher, <laughs> not us. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Bye. Mike? Um, okay, um, so this is actually from the perspective of, of nearly uh, 20 years ago. Links will be 20 next year. Yeah. It's hard to believe that. Yeah. I was just thinking back to the, the Manchester Wright meeting uh, when Links had a 10th birthday party. <laughs> Um, and, and of course, things will be 20 next year, which is quite huge. Um, hidden challenges are somewhat Another different. Cake. Another cake. Um, <laughs> so, I like cake. I think cake's brilliant. Um, anyway, uh, the technical challenges were somewhat different because the services were not the same as they were now. Um, the main reason Links existed was because of the high cost of uh, connectivity to the US. Um, you know, what, we, what were we paying for like 1.5 meg you know, mm -hmm. T1 circuits to the US was, was astronomical yeah. I, and, and obviously actually but it was still the same thing that it was actually more expensive sometimes to buy a circuit to uh, Frankfurt than it was to yeah. the US as well though there were issues like that uh, but in terms of the technical challenges as the IXP operator peering was really new to a lot of people so we already touched on it before was technical awareness of some of the members particularly the new members when they attached they were generally used to being downstream of a, of a single transit provider or maybe two transit providers and then they attached to an exchange so the technical awareness of some of the members was a challenge so you have things like wrong net mask proxy mm -hmm. ARP set IP redirect set people actually trying it on and stealing bandwidth via a tunnel so we actually had somebody that was um, stealing bandwidth to the US over the exchange <laughs> through a tunnel um, off, of, off, off of like three or four of the larger, uh, larger people that, that, that were on, the, on links that had got circuits to the US and they thought, well, we only need five meg and, and, and they've, got, uh, they've got an STM1. Uh, we only need five meg, so we'll steal five meg off them today and we'll steal five meg off them tomorrow and we'll just keep changing where this tunnel points. <laughs> Um, and that was partly enabled by the bad way that um, I'm, going, I'm going to be naughty, I'm going to say it's talk bad of an exchange, uh, the bad way that the WorldCom maze were run in the US, they didn't have enough hygiene and policy and sort of technical control around them, so it allowed these people that were stealing bandwidth to have a router attached to the May, but it didn't have any backhaul for connectivity, it just had tunnels that went back over the May to other places, so there was technical challenges like that of people stealing bandwidth and pointing default, um, and that was just the technical, so technical awareness of members, so some people didn't know they were having bandwidth stolen from them uh, for quite some time, uh, but then there was you know, less, less concerning stuff like full routing table leaks and, and just oh, yeah. just lo lots of full routing table yeah. leaks <laughs> um, and setting up net, net mask wrong yeah. and yeah. then setting proxy up and therefore answering up for the other half of the, if you imagine the peering LAN is a slash 23 for instance, they would configure a slash 24, they'd have two interfaces, yeah. one in each slash 24, <laughs> um, yeah, and that was just a recipe for disaster. Um, <laughs> And then the other sort of, this is more organisational really, the other sort of challenge, it's more of how do you continue to grow? Links had grown to a certain number of members and it had mostly the larger UK um, ISPs there. And of course back then everybody was an all-round ISP, it wasn't this guy's a, um, a, an eyeball network selling access and this guy's a content player. People did a bit of everything. They were this all-round ISP. They had some dial-up. They had some hosting. Sold a bit of BGP connectivity, you know, BGP downstream connectivity. Um, and what happened was the larger guys, once they were on links, who sold transit to the smaller guys in the UK, they wanted to get in links and then pull a ladder up behind them and stop their customers joining links, because they saw that their customers joining links would eat their revenue. So they were trying to make organisational 
moves to say, well, you have to have independent connectivity to arbitrary places in the world, be it you know, uh, Northern Virginia or something like that. Um, and they're, they're just trying to protect their own business, basically. <coughs> So th those were the sort of key things that I think, and then back, you know, the other last sort of technical one was bottlenecking in people's back halls. So they'd have their router on the exchange, but their connectivity out of the exchange wasn't necessarily good enough to service the amount of traffic people were trying to uh, exchange, people, people trying to give them. Yeah. And of course you get people would upgrade a port on the exchange, particularly when 100 meg came along and then gig E, people would upgrade ports. And of course, what that would do is actually release bottlenecks elsewhere in other people's networks, because of course the exchange point port was a bottleneck at one point. That's gone. It's released the bottleneck, and things like TCP back pressure are happening somewhere else now. Thanks, Mike. Harold. Yeah. To mention something that the other speakers did not mention yet. Uh, I mean, uh, our exchange point started in, in a building, in a university building, this was planned as a library in the 1950s, so to give you some background. And you should never ever underestimate the amount of place and electrical power you need, yes. especially if you get more members maybe than expected in a certain point of time. So uh, we have been very few, very early restricting the, the kind of equipment that is allowed to be installed. So we said, okay, you can come to us, you can be uh, at your exchange point, but please bring, bring only the equipment you need for doing your peering job and nothing else because we got lots of queries of okay oh, fine can I put my, my router to you okay and can I bring some servers along to put them near to the router <laughs> but, oh no you can't because we would like to make you an offer but we don't have power and we don't have space for that I mean in the meantime we found several small and bigger solutions for that we were able to get more physical space so we have now more racks and 24 by 7 access even at the university but still the power pr problem is here because we just can't get more power into the building uh, but uh, in uh, around 2000 we decided to open a second pop a second pop in a professional data center so power cooling and place is no limitation there it's just a matter of how many euros or dinars you spend per month and uh, we I think this is a good step going to a way where you have more resilience because you have more than one pop, so don't rely only on one, on one side. And if you have, want to install a lot of equipment, then please choose the, the big professional data center. Thank you. Interesting. Um, are there any questions from the audience yet? OK, my next question. Um, what tools uh, did you uh, are essential to your um, IXP? Um, specifically, I guess in the, in the early startup days, did you have any tools? And if not, what you know, what 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 changes came along that made you feel like, oh, we can't live without this tool like, at your IX? Um, Harold, since we uh, ended with you, let's start with you this time. I think the the most important kind of tool you can have or you should have. And it doesn't depend on whether you start an XP or you are operating it for a long time already, is monitoring. You have mm -hmm. to know what is going on, and especially you have to know what is not working at the moment. Uh, we decided to uh, go for non-commercial uh, non software for monitoring purposes, and have now a tool called Isinga, uh, that is freeware, and we monitor the status of all our uh, ports, of all our BGP sessions, and if I mean here our, I mean the PGP sessions of the route servers and also for the peering routers that we operate on our own, which gives you a better overview if, for example, just one member gets lost or the route server is dead or something like that. It helps you to correlate as if you monitor as much as possible. And uh, of course, uh, this um, statistical information is also very important. We do have poor statistics and do we do have sampled flow statistics. So we see who is exchanging how much traffic with which peer. And if there is something completely different than normal, we can act on that. And there are also some freeware tools on the URX web page, like IXP Watch. This is a very useful tool that just listens all to all of the broadcast and neighbor discovery packets on the peering LAN and then reports if something is strong. Strong, sorry, 
strange. So if you see, for example, OSPF packets or CDP mm -hmm. packets or packets you shouldn't see on a broadcast domain. Can I just follow up on yeah. that? Can, yeah. um, one of the things that's really um, obvious on an exchange is it has this um, constant hum, if it, assuming that it's a layer two Ethernet exchange, which the majority are these days. Um, it has a constant background hum of ARP and neighbor discovery and, and other control frames. It just has this very constant hum. Um, it's fairly standard what's there all the time. When something breaks horribly in your exchange, what you see very quickly is this hum changes. So it's like your heartbeat almost. And by spotting changes in that very early on, you know that something's going wrong in your exchange. So you look for things like unknown unicast, because you know, well, hang on, so a device has gone flat, or a device is sending traffic with corrupt destination max, or something like that. So you'll start to see a lot of a lot of unknown unicast. So yeah, massively important to do that. And the other thing is, make sure you've got a robust management network, so that when you're actually trying to fix your exchange, your route to fixing the exchange is not going over the broken exchange. Yeah. <laughs> So otherwise, otherwise you're in a mess. <coughs> so making sure you've got a, a good, a good direct way into that, that doesn't depend on the exchange is really important. Yeah, out of band management, very important. Mm. So uh, you guys told everything. So then? we have a lot of graphs. We have <laughs> flow analysis. We have out of band management mm. for each and every box. Uh, and most important, we have Nenad's uh, experience and. Uh, and knowledge and uh, honestly I still did not uh, find a thing to propose to, to him that he already did not think of <laughs> so so uh, our uh, our network is really managed uh, and uh, monitored very very closely uh, we would never of course um, go into into details of communication of our customers mm -hmm. that was about to ask I was about to ask you about this stealing of bandwidth and about tunneling do we really can stop customers to tunnel something you, you, the only way you'll see that is through it's not our job it's their yeah. it's, it's the ISP that's having the bandwidth taken from so it it's up to them to have their network instrumented so that they know what's going on in their network as well. We can't, we can't necessarily yeah. save everybody from themselves. Yeah, but our, let's say, BGP and uh, layer 2 hygiene is really, really strong and then yeah. it's taking care of that uh, and knock on wood for it's four the, years. The uh, best you can do then. We yeah. did not have yeah. any, any, any major yeah. uh, problems with, mm -hmm. uh, with mm -hmm. protocols. Okay, we had with... Uh, Air conditioning with power supply, yeah. <laughs> but uh, but in the in the network itself, really really not some huge difficulties. I, I do want to point out the bandwidth stealing was a one very particular dodgy organisation was doing it. It, it. it was it was a problem. That was a problem. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. We have can a. I, can I just add? Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, for us, uh, the major breakthrough was actually introducing root servers mm -hmm. and the portal. Before that. We had hard time to force people to make it, to register their prefixes, mm -hmm. to make their mm -hmm. announcement properly, etc., etc. And you know, every member, new member that came to six, they should ask everybody else for private pi for a bilateral peering. So that was really annoying. So root server helped us a lot here, and the, and the portal we have now. So this is for us, the major tool now. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from uh, Vesna in the audience. It's, it's more uh, common. And, <coughs> and uh, additional, well, I'll just shout. An uh, additional tool that I can suggest for those who are not going to be here tomorrow is RIP Atlas probes. So <laughs> I'll have a whole talk about it tomorrow, but it is quite a useful tool for internet exchanges and other operators in general, but specifically for internet exchanges. Thank you. And if I may add to that, we will host uh, anchor of uh, no. Rye Patlas. Good. <laughs> Good. Okay, so actually we've we've actually run out of time, but I want to ask one 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 last question, um, and then uh, while while the panel uh, while you guys answer that question, if you could just do a do a round up as well, then uh, then I think we should all be heading to lunch soon. So my last question is. 
Uh, and this is uh, Matthias, as you uh, mentioned earlier. How important is it to building a community around uh, the around uh, well, not just the IXP, but for networks in general? The most important. Yeah. Can I be sure this? This is the the priority one, I would say. Then all things go along. If you have strong community, if you have if you meet, if you exchange knowledge, everything will happen in a proper way. Otherwise, that's yeah. it. Yeah, I'll second that. Massive, absolutely massive to have a com community first. Yeah. Um, worry about governance and other things like that later. If you try and do it the other way around, you, you just won't get off the ground. Um, when you've got the community behind you, yeah. It's easier to deal with the challenges when they do come down the line. Yeah. I mean, the, the community has two important aspects, I think. It has to do with the communication of the members of an exchange point to the exchange point itself, but also the members amongst each other. So if they encounter some problems, let's say ISP A does something bad to ISP B, and they know the telephone number of each other, they can mm -hmm. solve problems on a very short way. So this this kind of community also helps us as IXP operator because they solve their problems without us. That's good for all of us. Right, yeah. yeah. Okay, I was just hoping that nobody would use the word uh, crucial because that's crucial. the word <laughs> that I thought of and my English is not the best one. So crucial, definitely yeah. crucial to have a, a good understanding of, com of a community. Yeah, great. Okay, and uh, well, you know, just to summarise that, I think, you know, like, like, as, uh, as uh, I think Mike, you mentioned earlier that, uh, you know, having the different, uh, when, when you first set up an internet exchange, there's a lot of uh, uncertainty of what an internet exchange is, or what are the benefits, or how is it going to help you, and I think having the community there as well, um, even providing support for each other. Uh, can be really, really beneficial. So, uh, um, and like I said before, you know, having workshops like this, where it gives you an opportunity to understand what goes on and also learn new things, is uh, hopefully you've uh, so far you've had a good day. <laughs> and uh, with that, I think we are done, and it's time for lunch. But uh, I'd like to give the panel a round of applause and thank you very much. So, thank you. Thank you.